I really appreciate many of the speakers who came before me who uh, really gave a very important, critical picture, both visual and intellectual, of the crisis in the Middle East. And I, I think if that didn't compel us to think about why we should be engaged in the discussion, then I don't know what will. And I think that it's really historic also, the times that we live in, the discussion that we're having about the Middle East is happening in the wake of the Arab Spring in 2011, the Occupy Movement in the United States in 2011, the same year. And last year, the rise of the idea of socialism in the United States, which is a really remarkable thing for us to note, in a presidential election year when uh, most of the conversation about mass movements and social movements typically dies down in US presidential election year. Last year was a unique year that that did not happen, and not only did that not happen, the figure who ended up capturing the imagination of the mass of young people in the United States was neither Donald Trump nor Hillary Clinton. It was Bernie Sanders, who ran openly as a democratic socialist and boldly talked about the need for a political revolution against the billionaire class of the United States. And I want to, I want to use that as the context for our discussion because as a socialist, as a Marxist myself, my own analysis leads me to strongly believe that there will not be any solution to the misery that we see experienced by literally billions of people in this world. And, it, and, and, and my fellow speakers went into uh, some of the history of colonialism and imperialism. And uh, Brother Imam talked about the question of divide and conquer. And I think that's a very important starting point. And to understand why, why is this misery being perpetuated. And uh, you know, just to illustrate the crisis, I think uh, Sister Aisha laid out a very important you know, sort of current situation that is going on. She talked about the UN report that revealed that 20 million people in just four countries are faced with acute famine or you know, threat of famine. And Yemen has the largest crisis, but the other countries are, of course, northern Nigeria, South Sudan, and Somalia. And it is not incidental that the most acute crisis, and as you said, Sister Aisha, it's a human-caused crisis. It's a system-caused crisis. It's not a coincidence that the most acute crisis is observed in the areas that are right now torn by strife, political and other strife, or like Somalia, which have just recently seen massive conflict. And I think, uh, I mean, I agree with the, my fellow speakers that the media plays a big role in whether or not American people, and by American people, I mean people living in the United States. I don't, I'm not necessarily referring to any race per se. It is true, as you all have said, that the media plays a big role in what people get to hear about. And so it is true that Probably, I mean, it's not something I've studied, but I would probably believe that the vast majority of American working people do not know the severity of the crisis in Yemen and Syria. Yes, I, that may be true. I do think, though, that Brother Mohammed Namir went into a very, very important point, which is the question of power. And I, I, I mean, just stepping back, I, I don't know if you all will agree with me, but. I strongly believe that the vast majority of human beings will not condone this kind of carnage and bloodshed. The vast majority of human beings do not want war. But the question is, what choice do we have? I mean, if, if we had the choice of whether or not our sisters and brothers, our sons and daughters, our husbands and wives were to be sent to war or not, if we had the choice, if we had the power to decide the fates of our loved ones, then I do not believe that we would choose war. I do not believe that we would choose destruction because it is, 
it, it, if we had the power to decide that, then it would be a situation where our self-interest coincides with the collective interest of the human population. Unfortunately for us, we are in a system of global capitalism where such a thing is not possible. I mean, uh, I'm, I'm going to butcher this quote, but this was a quote, quote by one of the Black Panthers who said that if a white man is racist, that's his problem. I mean, if he has racist ideas, that's his problem. But if he has the power to kill me out of those racist ideas, then that's my problem. In other words, I, I think that if our system, our economic, political, and social system in the world reflected the true values of human beings as a whole, then we would not have war and strife and poverty. The problem is that for the vast majority of people, we don't have the choice to decide what's going to happen in the world. And that is why I think that we are not in a position to come up with a serious analysis of why things are the way they are and what would it take to change them unless we went to the root of the question of capitalism. I mean, this is a global system of capitalism and the things are the way they are because for, you know, depends on how close the links are, but ultimately you can trace everything that's happening, not just to UK and the United States, which I agree with, and as a, as a person from India, I, I don't, you know, we cannot deny the larger than life role played by American imperialism and British imperialism, but it is not about white men against black people or brown people. If you look at the colonization of Ireland by Britain, it was not a question of race, it was a question of power. And the question of power is closely linked to the, to, to the global system of capitalism. And we, we, we won't be able to understand why things are the way they are unless we look at capitalism itself. Just let's look at the numbers. Sister Aisha talked about the crisis in Yemen and the 20 million people who are uh, on the brink of st starvation. If you, if you look at the UN report, they will tell you that only 5.6 billion dollars will be needed to end that crisis. If you look at it from monetary terms, if you look at what will be needed to end the starvation and famine, it's just 5.6 billion dollars. I mean, I say 5.6 billion dollars not because I'm a multi-billionaire, I'm a working class person, but I say just 5.6 billion because look at where we are. We are in Seattle. We have Jeff Bezos who is one of the eight richest people in the world, and we have Bill Gates, another of those eight richest people in the world, who is well on his way to become a trillionaire. So, and I speak both as a socialist and as an economist at this point, if you look at it from a monetary or a financial or an economic resources standpoint, there is no shortage of resources in this world to not just feed everyone and make sure that they are not suffering from mal malnourishment, but there is more than enough resources in this world to ensure that all human beings can thrive with very high standards of living. The barriers are not the amount of resources. Grain is rotting in the granaries as people are starving. There is no shortage of natural resources. There is no shortage of uh, creativity and talent in in, in the human race. What is missing is a system that will facilitate this, uh, you know, facilitate the use of these massive resources into being used for the betterment of human society to make sure that everybody has a decent standard of living, to eliminate war, to eliminate uh, the, the killings of so many human beings throughout the world. And that system that will be able to deliver such, such, a, such a society that I think most human beings want is what I would call socialism. I mean, you, you, you can call it with any, any word you want, but it basically com comes down to socialism. Socialism is, is the idea of a global economic structure and social structure that can harness the enormous amounts of wealth in human society to deliver decent standards of living to everybody in the whole world in an environmentally sustainable manner. So it's not that we couldn't do it. It's not that this misery and bloodshed and death and war is in the DNA of the human race. 
it is in the DNA of the system of capitalism, though. And so if we are to talk about what can change, we have to talk about capitalism versus socialism. That is how, in my mind, the question is posed. But we can't just talk about it in generalities and rhetoric. We have to talk about actually what we can do. And I think that's where the question of where we are comes in, the question of Trump, the Trump era, and what role Americans, people who live in America, can play in this global situation. First of all, in contradiction to one of the speakers who preceded me, I think we have to be very, very careful in understanding that you cannot have any illusions in Donald Trump. Donald Trump is a multi-billionaire, right-wing bigot, racist, and misogynist. And it is a non-starter. If we are to talk about a better world, it is a non-starter for us to have illusions in him. That does not mean that I support the Democratic Party. I don't. But it is important to, under, to uh, correctly characterize what we are up against. And so I think that we are in a unique moment in human history where, uh, uh, you know, if you look at the land, political landscape of the United States, for decades, there were really no mass movements to speak of. And suddenly, you see a, you know, you see a, see a sort of a historic shift happening around us where it is not just isolated protests happening once in a while, but there is a shift in the overall mood of society. And, uh, and, and, and I think a lot of that is sort of observed by what we saw starting from the 2011. I don't think Donald Trump has created this mood. I think what's happened is that Donald Trump has been elected at a time when humanity, the, especially the younger generation, the millennial generation, was already starting to move into struggle. And I think the first signs that we saw of it was in the Arab Spring in early 2011. And in order to, you know, to speak, I, when I speak as a socialist, I speak as an internationalist, meaning when I, I would not characterize uh, the, when, when, when we talk about U, the U.S. supporting the, uh, the horrific regimes in the Middle East, it, that's correct. Yes, the U.S. is supporting the horrific regimes in the Middle East, but it is not U.S. American working people who are supporting it. They have no choice whether or not to support it. It's the political elite and the big business, the financial oligarchy that has all this power in the US capitalist sort of beast that is supporting it. So ultimately, I think the question for us is how do we take an international outlook about this and not have a nationalistic perspective? Because at the, at the end of the day, if we are against oppression, then we are against all oppression. Otherwise, we are not against oppression. So our fight against oppression and exploitation and war, in my view, cannot be defined as one, uh, one sect or one group of people against the other, defined by religions, religious differences or racial differences or ethnic differences, but they can be defined on the basis of class differences. And if you look at the system of capitalism, you, if, and if you trace the, where the power lies, the power to decide the fates of many people lies in the hands of a very tiny sliver, sliver at the top that decides what is going to happen. And so for us, as people in the United States, the best way that we can help our sisters and brothers in the Middle East and in North Africa and every, every other strife and war-torn region in the world is to, one, have a correct analysis of why this is happening, understand what it will take, and also understand, and I think this is, this is where I can bring something to the discussion, understand that the best way of challenging the US ruling class in its involvement and, it's the, and being the driving force of the misery in the Middle East is to build mass movements right here in the United States. And so I would appeal to you all that let us concretely get involved in the struggle that is developing around us. 
Right now, we are seeing, ever since Trump got elected, I mean, just to give you an example, when Trump was elected, that very moment, there was a deep sort of sense of shock and disbelief that this could actually happen. But the very next day, my organization, Socialist Alternative, we called nationwide protests the day after election. And at the moment that everybody else in the you know, political punditry class were, were, were you know, just shocked and paralyzed, the, Working people and young people were not paralyzed. They were looking to come out and fight back. And we built protests that brought 50,000 people to the streets in many cities in the United States. And that spirit has not died down. There is no protest fatigue, sisters and brothers. What's happening is the younger generation of our nation is demanding that we all build mass movements and fight back. There is not a despair, but a fire in the belly of young people to fight back. And that is why, concretely, what emerges in front of us is May Day, May 1st. May 1st is historically International Workers' Day. In the United States, it's been celebrated also as Immigrant Rights Day. Already we hear that many Latino immigrants hundreds of thousands, perhaps millions, nationwide, will be going on strike on May 1st. It is our job as South Asian, Muslim, white, black, Latino people to come together as immigrant workers and as US-born workers to say that we are not only going to fight Trump, we're going to fight oppression and exploitation of all kinds and launch May 1st as the, the, sort of the, the, the starting point of a summer of resistance against Trump, against bigotry, against exploitation, and against capitalism. <laughs> Just one more question. For those of you who are either working or studying at the University of Washington, there is going to be a unique historic opportunity. Many unions, many labor unions in, this, in the Seattle area are in the process of taking a vote of their membership to go on strike on May 1st. In, uh, throughout the Seattle public schools, the Seattle Education Association this coming week is going to be the membership of that union, which is basically educators, teachers, and other staff are going to be voting on whether or not they want to go on a day of, go on strike to re sort of record the day of resistance, record their solidarity with the immigrant community. But the uni University of Washington is a un in a unique position to, to, to make a statement. The UAW Local 4121, which represents graduate student workers, is going to be, is, their leadership has just voted to hold a membership approval on strike, and it's very likely to pass. And if all the labor unions that represent workers in the, uh, on the university campus right here, and students, student groups, everybody gets together and demands that the Board of Regents give you all a day off without retaliation. And if we can bring a massive, we bring all the students walk out, come on Red Square, tens of thousands, have a massive teaching. And in the evening, we all head to Westlake for the big rally where we can meet everyone. That, my sisters and brothers, will send a shock of fear to the US ruling class, which is not only carrying out exploitation, homegrown exploitation of workers here, but it is exporting exploitation in the Middle East and in other regions. So the only way and the best way that we can fight is to build mass movements here and concretely. I, I really hope you will join me on May 1st. And as, as a way to build for May 1st, join us at a socialism conference that will happen on April 2nd, Sunday, April 2nd, right here in Kane Hall at noon, where we're going to talk about how to make Seattle the center of the resistance against Trump. <laughs>